Kilkenny and Calvo Enterprises, yes, election season is in progress. And that's why we are bringing you KUAM News' Decision 2020, where we interview uh, candidates on their stances and issues ahead of the uh, primary election and our candidate slate for this morning. Uh, we have Speaker Tina Munia Barnes, uh, Republican newcomer Vince Borja, incumbent uh, Senator Jose Pito Terlahi, and Republican newcomer Don Edkulani. That's uh, coming up here in Decision 2020. 904, let's go ahead and start the clock and uh, bring on Speaker Tina Munia Barnes onto the uh, show. Of course, uh, the Speaker. Uh, seeking an, another term and we'll just go ahead and, and start there uh speaker we'll give you the floor uh, maybe for an open why do you think uh, people should re-elect uh speaker tina munia barnes to the next uh, guam legislature see jewish marcy uh um chris and manana see jewish to you and sabrina and to the listening audience out there um chris i have the passion i have the heart our people are are still hurting and I know that I am a great facilitator. I want to continue to make a difference. Uh, some may, I may not be a fan for some, but I want you to know that I never quit. If there is an issue, no matter how tough it is, I will follow it through. I will facilitate it through until we get the complete answers. And I think that uh, as a testament to what we've done for our greatest generation, to give them what is rightfully deserving of them. I think um, uh, I just want to say for the freedoms we live today because we were able to be free because our Zionists have suffered the atrocities of World War II. But closing the chapter for them and continuing to be the voice for those who still haven't gotten compensated Chris and Sabrina, I continue to have my doors open to each and every one of them. I want to continue to bring relationships within the blue continent, our brothers and sisters within Micronesia, and I want to be able to keep Guam safe. As we look at trying to rebrand our island, have it cleaner, greener, healthier, I want to make sure that the protocols are in place in as far as the safety. So you know what? I've never stopped whether people agreed with me or not. We have to test, test, test. And I guess uh, based on uh, Dr. Manglonia's comments, I think testing is key to helping protect uh, and put the protocols in place for our community. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I give you my heart. I, I don't have any vested interest, but our people of Guam and I give you my heart. Uh, speaker, so, uh, you know, one of the recurring themes that we're seeing in this election is uh, the checks and balances between the different branches of government and the Republicans, man, they're coming hard and they're 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 uh, throwing hands on you and, and your Democratic supermajority saying that you guys have failed to police your <coughs> own party and calling uh, Governor Lulian Guerrero and Lieutenant Governor Josh Tenorio's administration uh, out on, you know, just pretty much everything is what is what they're saying. So. How would you address those uh, very uh, valid uh, concerns that people have about the Democratic supermajority of which you are the lead in the legislature, just not doing enough uh, to promote the transparency and accountability that a lot of people think we need from this administration? Chris uh, and Sabrina, uh, information is key. And uh, though we can agree to disagree on issues that are on and we need to make sure that we keep our people alive. This is an invisible war that nobody has ever asked for. And every day information is changing and it is our responsibility to bring the information out to our community. It is our responsibility to look for resources out there. It is our responsibility to keep the communication with the administration. It is the legislature that provides policy. It is the executive branch that executes. And if there's a differences of opinion, that's why there's a third branch of government. But we must be key. We can, we may not always agree, but let us agree to disagree. And I'm saying that, that it is very, very, very important that um, we take the time to listen to our people. I am on conferences with the speaker, I mean, with the administration uh, every week. I go on the weekly, uh, meetings uh, with uh, with uh, uh, Uncle Sam, uh, with the federal government. And let me tell you, bringing information and then getting solidified that, that, that resources are coming down our way, 
and we continue to have to look for that but it has to be a collaborated effort we shouldn't pit one against each other is because together when we do things together we can overcome the ordeals that we we have today but we cannot keep pitting one against the other uh I'm sorry, Speaker, did you answer the question about whether or not, well, let me just rephrase it. Um, do you believe that the Democratic supermajority under your leadership has done what's necessary to hold the Democratic administration accountable? Definitely, we've, we've held them accountable. We've had oversight hearings. We, I myself, as the oversight chair on accountability, have had information hearings with the administration every oversight in this legislature from health labor education uh, public safety health education safety have had oversight hearings information hearings and and let me tell you chris and sabrina it is important that those the the, the information gets out to our community and we need to be able to work together and yes we've hold, held them accountable and yes we continue to to ask and request uh, when there is a need. And yes, we need to look at opportunities and resources that are not within, because we shouldn't take from Peter to pay Paul. We have to find new opportunities out there. And we have to even go back to the basics. If we have to look at, 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 at working with our community residents on, on literally going back to the basics, yes, we need to do all of that. But holding a holding the administration accountable is key and that's what we've been doing with all these informational hearings with all these public hearings that we continue to have and i think that the legislature has done a good job you know we may agree to disagree in as far as the party affiliation but i have been really open and and working bipartisan support with with our colleagues in the legislature and and uh from from working into getting uh cameras into working opportunities for for working with wholesalers with senator jim moylan with working uh having bipartisan support with uh senator mary torres and and working with our customs and uh, uh to protect our borders working to to uh include and reciprocate uh, and bring nurses into our community these are all key but we need to be able to share the information and be public with what we do. And I think this legislature has done a very fair job. We have brought parity to this table. Speaker, we ha I had a, a question actually from um, someone in the legislature about session. Uh, and I wonder this kind of too, what is up with all the recesses called? You know, <laughs> when, 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 when individuals have an opportunity to ask legal for, for advice or counsel, when there is an opportunity to have colleagues work together and make amendments, or uh, I think it's important that they be afforded the time so that they can work their, their concerns out. And recess has uh, always been a tool to help our colleagues negotiation uh, negotiate how they can meet make a bill become better uh if <laughs> chris and sabrina if our colleagues are not ready on a bill that they have it's important that if they have ideas from other colleagues that can strengthen the bill or make it better i think that opportunity should be afforded to them right uh, as you know in the past when we were in recess we completely uh, uh, literally went off a uh, uh, live stream, but nowadays when we are in recess, everything stays open so that you can see our colleagues working on on whatever issue we have on the floor. I wish to we see could hear how it. We can get the affirmative to move forward. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, speaker, under under your leadership, uh, you know we we've had the minority leader on, and I've seen it. We all saw it during COVID when the session was just live for everyone to see. Uh, talking about people's mics getting cut off, people getting cut off when they're talking, uh, minority senators just, uh, you know, not being given the time of day, and all this under your watch. How would you address uh, people and even your colleagues' concerns about just the, the pettiness and the lack of decorum that we have just seen all too often in uh, the legislature under uh, your speakership? Chris, it's really important to know that 
I don't have control over the mics. I definitely don't. And I need you to know that uh, there is a process uh, that, that the presiding officer must upkeep when discussions are being done. There are provisions in the standing rules that give an opportunity for a colleague to speak. And if someone is out of order, I must be able to adhere to the guidelines. And yes, we can get very, very passionate about how things get facilitated, but the important key for the presiding officer is to make sure that there is peace, collaboration, and if there is something that is in violation of the standing rules or 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 the um, uh, rules that are presented, the uh, Mason's rules, then I have to be able to call that to order. Mm -hmm. And you know what? I I have been. I believe in my heart that I've been very fair in affording the opportunity for all my colleagues to be given the opportunity to speak on the issues, whether it be passionate or or, or heartfelt. Uh, I think I've, I've given that fair parity on the floor. Mm -hmm. You know, Speaker, you said a lot about uh, transparency, uh, bipartisanship, working together. Uh, but, you know, we haven't heard a lot, uh, and some of your colleagues have also um, sent out press releases about this, about uh, the budget. I mean, this is a serious times uh, we're dealing with, and we haven't, even us in the media, haven't heard a lot about what is the latest revenue projection. I mean, obviously, we're not going to be dealing with a, a billion-dollar um, budget for next fiscal year. Why you know, uh, Sabrina, thank you for asking that question. I think it's really important that uh, as, as I was working closely with the uh, uh, OFB uh, chairperson and him giving the presentation to all the senators uh, and him him asking that we call a session for the budget a little bit earlier, I guess four days earlier from how we started last year, I think it was important. This is, we are in a time where uh, things, this pandemic was unprecedented. This is an issue for that nobody has asked for. Things have flattened. We need to look at alternatives. We need to look at our resources that are coming in. And I think that the request from the oversight chair of OFB is, is justification enough to at least start four days early. And as we continue to get information on a daily basis, I think starting four days early is, Good enough. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you guys know that uh, in the past, uh, a budget did not have to be submitted to the administration until September 30th for the new fiscal year. In the last couple of terms, the statute has changed and we as a legislative body have to submit a budget by August 30th. Right. So yes, yes, it is very important that we start on the budget now. And you know, normally, June, July, and August is uh, uh, reserved time for the chairman of OFB to go through all the public hearings uh, for budget and to hear from all the agencies and all the groups out there that need to present and uh, justify why they need the resources from the general fund. Mm -hmm. Speaker, I was at a mayor's council of Guam meeting. You were there, uh, uh, Senator Pito Terlahi was there. And one of the things that I think it was Mayor Rudy Matsunani uh, who mentioned about the, the unfairness about the budgets that the mayors get um, in terms of everybody gets the same amount and they also all get the same uh, amount of staffers. And that was from um, Mayor Paco uh, from MTM. And, Right. And, and is that something that you plan on addressing in uh, the next term if elected? Thank you very much, uh, Sabrina, for that question. I want to share with you that this issue in reference to the proportion of the funding that gets uh, to the mayors has been an issue that has been around since I was in the 27th Guam legislature, which was in 2002 and three. I mean, three and four, I want to share with you that the the resolution that have, has come to play on that was looking at the the, uh, the mileage of, of land within the specific village. Uh, that was one of the, the compromises that were talked about, uh, looking at the demarcations of uh, how big uh, or how small a village was. And again, time after time after time, I've, I've asked the mayors, share with me 
how you would bring to the table the parity from those big villages like Derido, Jigo, Barragata to the smaller villages, villages in the southern area. Speaker, and I just want to... Everybody wanna, uh, talked about being fair. We have it a minute. It's a decision that the mayors have to make, and I want to continue to facilitate that for them. Okay. There are a lot of things that uh, have changed as far as what their desires are on how uh, distributions are handed out. We, in the past, uh, through my authorship, has worked with them on the non-appropriated funds, uh, worked with them on having uh, village uh, fairs, uh, taught, uh, uh, gave them ordinances to administer oaths, and even to do marriages so that they can can have uh, resources that are put into their coffers. So mm -hmm. I think that uh, it's a collaboration Speaker, of all the mayors. Uh, Speaker, it, Speaker, it, yeah, Speaker we, sorry, you have you have 20 seconds to just wrap it up because we've got to move on to our yeah, next candidate. Yeah. Uh, but we're going to get you on again uh, after the primary. Right. No, no worries, Sabrina and uh, Chris. When um, Uncle Jesus Masi for giving this me this opportunity our people of guam have a very special gift uh, a powerful gift of vote i humbly ask uh, that you consider me i'm number 11 on the democrat side i give you my heart i give you my hard work and my passion to be your public servant in the 36th guam legislature so from dr lunacidus masi kuam and our listening audience more important god bless each and every one of you Sanamasi. Thank you, Thanks, Speaker. Speaker. All right, uh, nine uh, twenty. We'll keep it going uh, and stay in the Zoom room.